Hello everyone, my name is Yehudan Avea, I'm the city of Classic, and I would like to tell you a little bit of what it means to write down models and why it's important for quantum computing. I will share the various facets of high-level modeling. Actually, it's, it's not related just to programming. It's the basic way of conveying information in whatever aspect of life we deal with. And especially, there is nothing special about quantum here. In the programming arena, conveying information through high-level languages has been the pinnacle of classical computing for decades. We are still not there in quantum computing. And this is the reason why we formed this company, Classic. To provide a high-level way of interacting with a quantum computer, as you are so used to regular computing. It involves the language side, but much more importantly, it involves the technology side. And in fact, when I think of Classic, I think of it as the company providing the technology for this ability of writing down and expressing high-level ideas and using the technology to translate it into the machine code. So let's look at, into the concept of high-level thinking. To do that, we must always start with the person. So Alice decides to create a quantum algorithm. She has some intention in mind. Maybe she just invented a new quantum algorithm, or maybe she wants to experiment with a known quantum algorithm and change it a little bit. Maybe it's revolutionary, maybe it's evolutionary. But either way, she certainly has some idea in mind. That's where it always starts. The idea that sits in her head. At this stage, even Alice to herself cannot really articulate it very well even though she knows exactly what she wants to do. There's no contradiction in there. In our head, we always have a very clear vision. It does not make it easy to articulate this vision. Ideas in our head are not in words, and conveying information is done through words. So the transformation of those ideas into words is not only hard, it's enchanting. So the first step that Alice should do is write down her ideas. And it should be done in a way that will be descriptive enough and will actually allow her to describe what she has in mind, her ideas. So the model Alice writes should be descriptive, should have the richness to convey one's thoughts and ideas. Now, equally important, the model should not include details that are not important for Alice, that she did not think about them thoroughly. Alice should care only about what she did think about. That's the only place where human com creativity comes about, in the ideas we create. If she needs to think and write in details, she will lose all the focus of her creativity. And now a third piece. The model also needs to be formal, meaning that it has a clear, well-defined meaning. It does not mean that it has to have all the details, but whatever it does have must be crisp and cannot be interpreted or should not be interpreted in many ways. It must not be ambiguous. First and foremost, the formality is important as a vehicle for Alice to crystallize her ideas. In this method of writing ideas formally, Alice will need to ask herself many questions about what she really means. We are all familiar with this important and hard step. What do we really mean? Articulating formally is a crucial step in crystallizing those thoughts of ours. But second, once the model is written formally, it can now be understood by others who are not sitting inside Alice's head. So Alice created a way to convey her idea to her colleagues, Bob and maybe Charlie. Writing her ideas in a formal way will minimize the friction caused by misunderstandings and will allow Bob and Charlie to grasp exactly what Alice thinks and wanted to convey. Alice can now even publish her ideas, so many people will be able to understand precisely what Alice created be able to reproduce it, to scrutinize it, and build upon it with their own ideas. And all this only due to Alice's ability to express her ideas formally. 
And then there is the third reason for writing the model in a formal way. And that is that now we can pass the model through a compiler, a software tool, a synthesizer if you like, which will take those ideas when they describe the algorithm and produce machine code out of them. This is because unfortunately a computer, any computer, a quantum computer, a classical computer, a hybrid computer, is able to read only a very formal set of instructions with all the necessary details. For a computer, even if you miss a single point of detail, for example, the memory location or how many auxiliary qubits to use, the computer will not be able to operate. It will stop and report a fault. A computer does not think in an abstract way. A computer needs a very detailed set of instructions what to do. So the responsibility of the compiler or the synthesizer is to understand what Alice has said at the high level and fill in all the details for the computer. This is a thing a compiler can do only if Alice writes in a formal, although high level language. A compiler cannot yet understand the natural language and certainly cannot deal with ambiguities in the description. So our vehicle for expressing thoughts is a language. We need to think of the language which captures the concepts above. It must be descriptive, high level and formal and be useful for ideas coming from quantum computing. The language needs to support the full spectrum between abstract ideas and detailed descriptions because sometimes the details are important to Alice and sometimes they are not. It must be formal in order for Bob and Charlie to understand what Alice conveyed even if they live in a different country and speak a different language. And it must come with a true compiler able to read the high-level model and create hybrid machine code. That's where technology, or part of the technology, comes about. Compilers are, but are abundant in classical computer, going from a multitude of high-level programming languages into a similar variety of machine codes. But we are missing such compilers in quantum computing. Now we do have transpilers, but transpilers translate gate-level circuits to other more optimized gate-level circuits. They do not fill in any details. They do not allow the user to write at a high level. So a true compiler is an essential new tool that we need to create and which you will experience here in this hackathon. But further, to enlarge our technology set, once Alice's model is compiled into machine code, this code needs to run on the hybrid classical quantum machine. Now when you think about it, all quantum algorithms are actually hybrid algorithms. Even Shor's algorithm, the most quantum of all, requires an extensive back and forth between the quantum modular exponentiation and Fourier parts and the classical number theoretical calculations done on the classical computer. This operating system that we need, the operating system aspects of allocating and running the machine code on the various computational resources is another aspect that we provide and that you will experience here in the hackathon. And lastly, after Alice's ideas have been conveyed as a formal high-level model compiled into hybrid machine code and run on the computers or the simulators, Alice needs to inspect the results she got and change them and improve her ideas, expand on what she did earlier in order to create something even better. Those results should again be presented to Alice in a high-level way for her to make sense of what she sees. So Alice needs a means to understand what went right, what went wrong, whether she got what was indeed what she meant to get. This closing the loop type of analysis embedded in the analyzer tool is the next aspect that you will experience in the next few days. So we classic provide you with the language to describe high-level models 
the compiler to translate them, the operating system to run the code, and the analyzer to close the loop through understanding of the results. All this embedded as an integrated development environment for quantum computing. I wish you all a very pleasant activity and encourage you to continue to the next interesting lectures from here. And most importantly, I wish you all a great fun in working through your quantum algorithms and a great thank you for your participation. Thank you. Hi again, and welcome to part two of lesson two of the Classic Bootcamp. In the first lesson, we've seen how to use and explore quantum algorithms and applications using the Classic ID. We discussed the process from selecting the application or the algorithm, synthesizing a circuit, executing it, and analyzing the results. In the previous video, the first session of this lesson, Yuda taught us about high-level functional design and its importance. Now, we will dive deeper with concrete examples and explore its advantages. We will see how functional design allows us to optimize an algorithm for minimal circuit depth and then to re-optimize the same algorithm to achieve minimal circuit width. We will consider various constraints like the maximum number of qubits. Our first example is learning functional level design with the Grover algorithm. After synthesizing it, we obtain a quantum circuit. This circuit prepares two quantum registers in specific states. Quantum register A can take values from 0 to 3, and quantum register B can also take values from 0 to 3. Using the Grover operator, we aim to find solutions where A plus B equals 4. This results in three possible solutions, A equals 2 and B equals 2, A equals 1 and B equals 3, and vice versa. Executing the circuit using the air simulator confirms these results. We indeed receive three possible results. 1, 0, 1, 0 means 2 plus 2. 0, 1, 1, 1 means 1 plus 3, and 1, 1, 0, 1 means 3 plus 1, so indeed the algorithm is working as expected. In fact, in this example, we incorporate previous knowledge that A and B cannot be 0. If A equals 0, B needs to be 4, but it is limited between 0 and 3, because we allocated only 2 qubits for each register. Therefore, we prepare the states of A and B to be an equal superposition of 1, 2, and 3, without the 0. As we can see by this red line, the circuit involves an auxiliary qubit, and its purpose will become clear shortly. We can see the circuit details here on the left. First, we see the circuit depth, which is 495, and the number of qubits is 6. Let's zoom in inside the Grover operator. We see an arithmetic oracle and a Grover diffuser. Now we can understand that the auxiliary qubit that we've seen is used by the arithmetic oracle. But the auxiliary qubit is not merely an auxiliary. It is used for the phase kickback a common structure in quantum algorithms. Now, when we zoom in into the arithmetic oracle, we encounter for the first time the multi-control knot. The multi-control knot, also called the MCX, is of high importance in quantum algorithms, and especially in the optimization the classic engine applies. In this example, we have three control qubits and one target qubit. When the state of all control qubits is one, the state of the target qubit should flip from zero to one and vice versa. Now let's focus only on the MCX implementation. We can open it up and view the implementation of this circuit as it decomposes into one and two qubit gates. This MCX can be generated from the synthesis page. We just need to change in the model what is the number of control states we want, three in our example. Okay, so we have the Grover algorithm with the MCX within it. What's next? We want to generate the same algorithm with shorter depths at the expense of more qubits. A motivation for shorter depth is that it is one of the main factors leading to errors on today's quantum computers. Here we can see the exact same algorithm, our Grover algorithm, but now it is optimized for shorter depth. We can see that the parameters of this circuit are different. The circuit depth is 411 compared to 495 we had previously on the expense of the use of seven qubits compared to six. This is the first example and the first time we encountered two different circuits implementations of the exact same algorithm. Let's understand what is actually different within the implementation. When we zoom in into the Grover operator again, we still see the arithmetic oracle with the phase kickback. Now when we zoom in within the arithmetic oracle, we see an MCX with one auxiliary qubit. The functionality of this MCX is the same, applying a NOT gate on the target qubit when all three control qubits are in the state 1. 
But here, for the implementation of this M6, there is one additional qubit that enables the circuit to be shallower. Let's focus only on the M6 with one auxiliary qubit. We can see that the depth of this M6 is only 22, with 5 qubits, compared to the depth of 27 for the M6 with no auxiliary we had before. The implementation of this M6 is completely different from the implementation of the M6 without the auxiliary qubit. Now, when you go back to the Grover algorithm, we can see the implementation of the M6 with the auxiliary within the Grover algorithm, and the implementation of the M6 without the auxiliary within the Grover with fewer qubits. So what we have seen here? This was the first example we covered that we actually saw under the hood that the same algorithm can have several implementations. We started with the same functional model, the same algorithm, and synthesized it once for short depth and once for short width, and we actually received these two implementations according to what we wanted. Now we've started to scratch the surface of why functional design is useful. Okay, but I can understand people that might say this is only a small example and not really useful. Sure, this was our first educational example. Let's go now into a larger example that results in a large difference between its implementations. We will continue with our MCX, but now we will choose one with 14 control qubits and one target qubit. We optimize it once for depth and receive an implementation with 21 qubits, five of which are auxiliaries, and depth of 36. But when we optimize for width, we receive an implementation with only 16 qubits at the expense of a very large circuit depth of 885. So here we can start already to see large differences between different implementations of the same function of Bidum law. We have a circuit depth of 36 on the one hand compared to a circuit depth which is 25 times larger with 885. This is already a difference that can make a real impact on the success of some implementation of the quantum algorithm. But it's not that we can only optimize for depth or for width, we can do more. We can impose some additional constraints and to receive an intermediate implementation. For example, here, we want to optimize this 14 MCX for the shortest depth, but to use only 18 qubits. We receive the circuit that uses all 18 qubits with a circuit depth of 315, which is less than 885, but is more than 36. Okay. Where can we see this 14 MCX in real quantum algorithm? Let's see together. We choose now a larger example of the Grover algorithms, where we have a nice API on the right to change the expression we are looking for. We want to choose for the solution of the equation a plus b plus c equals 84, where the values of a and b and c are stored in 5 qubits registers. This kind of algorithm can have some underlying applications, like white box fuzzing in cybersecurity. The synthesis of our Grover algorithms gives us this circuit. And now, when we zoom in, we can actually see our 14 MCX. So it's not just a standalone building block, it is actually used in several of the most common quantum algorithms. I hope you enjoyed this part of lesson 2, and you have a better feeling now of what does it mean high-level functional design, and how it can actually be utilized to generate substantially different circuits implementations for the same quantum algorithm. Thank you.